from Wakefield. It's the Nolan Cry at Night Show. I'm inviting you to join Nolan and his guest this week, Richie Kanam, to the show. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Nolan. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the show. Joining me this week is an amazing talent. You may know him from playing with everyone from Piano Men to Boys of the Beach and everyone else in between. When he's not on stage with the Lords of 52nd Street, he is in the studio as the founder and He's also a producer of Cove City Sounds, uh, Sound Studios in, um, on Long Island. He is the one, the only Mr. Richie Kanata. Richie, how are you today? Doing pretty good, man. How about you? We're, as, I, as we just said briefly before him, we're, we're doing the best now that everything's sort of dying down and we're sort of going past the craziness we've had the last three years. Life is sort of a, a little easier now, which is sort of where I want to start. And I had watched recently two interviews we had done on the Vibe Chamber over the last two years during the pandemic and you sort of talked about how you've dealt with the craziness. So at this point, as I just said, it being behind us almost, what's life like been for Richie Kanata? Well, it's a really good question because uh, we did nothing for about a year and a half, two years. I think the whole world was a standstill, but nobody really helped musicians. You know, we didn't get any help. Uh, There was all sorts of government grants and loans that were given to, you know, everybody else, but Broadway was closed down. We probably lost with the Lords of 52nd Street, the original Billy Joel band. We lost just way too many shows, too many venues with too many restrictions. So now to answer your question, we've kind of like triple, I I have triple booked myself. I am (laughs) taking everything and anything and having fun doing it because I love to make music. So I'll uh, like today, I've got a session with the guitar player with Spira Gyra. And then from there, I go go home and have dinner. Then I go into the city and do my Monday night jam. So it's been pretty busy. I sort of want to start from as, as early as I can with you at the time I have here. And knowing that you had played instruments from a very early age, your relationship with music, not just in terms of playing it, but also maybe realizing that you had some skills to do it professionally. Yes, I think it's, you know, with, with anything that's a God-given talent, you just, you know, you're, you're, the doors are open, but you have to do the heavy lifting. And uh, the comparative um, uh, world out there, when, when you're playing, I was playing clarinet at a very early age and I was actually pretty good at it. So they moved me to first chair in the orchestra in the band. And then I got into being better bands because of it. And then I um, started to play saxophone. So just, if you're good at your craft and you get recognized, you'll move forward. And then at some point I was actually making a living doing it, but it started at a very early age. By 13 years old, I was gigging, making money. Do you remember, though, a, a moment, and you probably do, a, a moment where you realized at, at that age, maybe that, hey, my skills are a little bit better than those around me, that maybe I can do this for a living? Uh, it almost started from the very first time I put a clarinet in my hand and I started to play and everyone got the clarinet at the same time. I could actually make sounds out of it. <laughs> I could actually play it. It was like, and these other kids are like squeaking and squawking, but it kind of worked for me. And and um, um, so I knew from there, but didn't know because it was an innocent thing because I was sure. about six years old. But I was going, I, I kind of like this, you know, and <clears throat> and it was that that thing that uh, then talk about competitive, put the competitive kind of um, wh- whatever it is in my in my head to do as much as I possibly could and do the be, to be the best at it, you know. Sure. Uh, a while ago, I had one of your 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 colleagues from Al Jardine's Endless Summer Band, um, Bobby Figueroa, on a while ago, and he talked about sort of the, the dues he had to pay, the early gigs he took to then get to the bigger stuff, playing with the Beach Boys and so on and so forth. When you're a young musician taking as whatever gig you can to then make it in the industry, how did you go about that in terms of accepting the fact that that's what needed to happen in order to get to the things like Billy Joel, Joel and so on and so forth. Well, I, I, it's Bobby's great, by the way, I love Bobby and have played with him for years and he's absolutely right. You've got to take every gig because you could be the best drummer or the best saxophone player in your basement, but nobody hears you who cares. Right. So you've got to take that gig. And unfortunately for musicians, we'll take a gig for almost no money. Or if it just pays a little, you do the gig just so you can get out there and be heard. So maybe right. somebody would hear you and that says, OK, yeah, the Beach Boys are looking for a drummer or, or Billy Joel is looking for a sax player that plays keyboards. And there I am. So you've got to take those gigs and you got to pay the dues. You got to. And plus the fact we love what we do. We sure. love making music. 
So there's much better <laughs> going out and doing a gig than pretending in your basement, you know? Sure. Uh, you obviously, as you just said, you have a love for music. Was there ever a moment where you maybe had self down in terms of can I make it? And was there ever a backup option to what you were doing? Or is it just music? It was always just music. And that's a good question. Uh, knowing that um, you always wonder, can I make it? Now, it, I, I keep finding out every day how much I don't know. You know, <clears throat> you think that, oh, my gig tonight is going to be amazing, but you don't know. You're only as good as the last time you mm -hmm. played. So I think you really have got to keep that in a proper perspective sure. where, um, the, look, there's someone right behind you that wants your gig. Sure. So when you take your instrument or you do your podcast, you got to be the best at that at that moment. Yeah. And you can't just shoot for the target. You have to shoot for the center of the right. target. You know. Yeah. So, um, so yes, there's always that, that. I think that's a thing about with any musician or any any uh, profession is that you you worry about if you're the best or you know someone's going to get your your job. Sure. Uh, Gary Griffin, a guy who plays with Brian, who played with um, Brian Wilson, I should say, and who had played with the Beach Boys briefly in the late 70s, had, had shared a story with me and how he always dreamed out about playing with the Beach Boys and how that was always his goal. Before you joined Billy Joel in the, the mid 70s, could you tell that your career was leading towards that or getting higher up? Or is it just something that sort of just happened naturally? It kind of it, it happened so quickly. It's kind of na a natural progression. As long as when you get the opportunity to join these organizations, these musical groups, you've got to show up, yeah. you know, otherwise they go, OK, thank you. And we'll get somebody else. But it's a, it's a natural progression if you're still staying ahead and on top of your uh, your game. Sure. You, you you joined Billy after a few albums that he had that had done fine. But then once you joined, there were a few albums that he had during that span that really superstarred on him into the stratosphere of legendary musicians. What was that like for you to join at, at that moment, but then also be playing that music with him as he's still a young musician? That was great because you're absolutely right. Billy had Piano Man. Then he had the uh, Street Life Serenade record that didn't do very well. Then he, he did the Turnstiles record, which he hired myself, Liberty, Doug, and Russell. Um, and then we made the, the hit records that is the bulk of his set list today. Yeah. You know, there was about five, six records that we did that were all the hits, but we were young. We were in our twenties and our early thirties. And um, we really, we were, really, it was, it was the greatest time because we were very creative. But then when we did the records, we went out and toured. So sure. we played the records. So the, so the audiences saw the guys that did the records. It wasn't yeah. just an artist that went out there and then, you know, had all studio musicians and then came out and put a, a, a road band together. We were, the studio band, the studio musicians, and the road band. Sure. And that that music is ours as well. Yeah. You know, those parts that I played on Scenes from Town Restaurant and, and New York State of Mind, those are all my my parts, sure. as well as it's Billy's song, but yeah. I added those parts. So I feel a very strong connect with that. <clears throat> I, what I've also learned of having musicians on here that have been part of the big time and success and that sort of stuff, talking about humbling experiences and humbling themselves and having... The, the dignity to stay professional just asking you about being there playing that music how do you keep yourself having a level head while that success is happening whether it's directly to you or indirectly uh another good question you, you got to remember that we all go to bed at night we all get up we all eat we all go to the bathroom you've got to have a level head there's nothing different about anybody in, on this planet as far as a, as a person it's just what we do in between those times that we're that when we're awake and um, it, it could be very distorted and you got to be very careful and not getting caught up in that, thinking that you are something that you're really not. Because, you know, we are blessed. It's about, you know, the God given ability that we were given this talent. Sure. We didn't go down aisle 19 at CBS <laughs> and get a box of saxophone talent. You know, this was yeah. given to us, sure. you know, it just is. Um, so you got to be careful and put everything in a proper perspective, because if you think that you're better than somebody else, you're really not. Exactly. You're really not. We're all we're all kind of like this this equal thing. We just we were just given the gift. So how did I parlay that gift into making a living and being better at it? Well, I honed in on it. That's where I might be different than people that are looking for a handout. We're, you know, sure. we're not. We need to. I practice every day. Uh, and I'm not joking. 
you know, I, I just about every day I practice. If I'm not practicing, I have a gig. So I'm doing my sure. my due diligence. You mentioned an interview you did with the Vibe Chamber of, of when you were with Billy, you were touring with the Beach Boys as a member of Billy's group in the, in the 70s. What was that like to tour with them at, at that moment? Prior to joining the win, because they were still relatively young at, at that point, they'd only been around for maybe 15 years or so. What was that like? That was kind of weird because they were they were clearly um, a West Coast Beach Boys, flowered shirts, yeah. talking about cars and 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 surfing, and we were a bunch of guys in black shirts talking about New York State of Mind. Yeah, you know, so it was a it was a weird combination. We opened up for them. And it was difficult for us because, again, we were these bunch of New York Tin Pan Alley guys opening up for happy, peppy, bursting with love and joy <laughs> Beach Boys, yeah. you know. Um, so it was difficult. But the connect was Carl Wilson. Okay. He loved us. He loved Billy. Sure. And we loved him, of which I got very, very close to him, of which at some point he asked me to join the Beach Boys. Yeah. At, at that point in the group, I mean, did even – experienced in the late 60s where they're they're struggling i think to be commercial again were you a fan when you were touring with them in the 70s with still with billy were you a fan of the music that they were putting out there or were you more just of a, of a musicologist in that sense no and i was i was a beach boy geek man back back in high school and stuff i mean uh, the beach boys were amazing you know the beatles beach boys very very strong in my influences of listening to music back in in uh, that time period and so I was a little bit in awe over the fact sure. that uh, we were going to be part of that. You know, they were they were older than we were and uh, we had not really established anything. I, we really haven't yet. You know, we sure. really had Piano Man, but I was not part of that. And that was again, that was singer songwriter and hired studio musicians and hired some guys to go on the road and play that song. But it was just that song. Sure. So when we when we did the Turnstiles record, we were playing the Turnstiles record opening up for the Beach Boys. Yeah. <laughs> at one point we we were so kind of i'm not gonna say bummed out but it, you know we, we'd be doing uh the set and billy would get hit in the head with a beach ball ball with people <laughs> looking for their seats you know we'd play these sheds we our set would be five o'clock six o'clock in the afternoon the sun would still be out people didn't get, really care that we were there sure. but <clears throat> so at one point we decided to do the whole turnstiles record from beginning to end no <laughs> not take a break just we just went through every song in the sequence of the record. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, sure. but it, look, I'm talking to you 45 years later. Something happened. Something was right about it. You sure. know, after a handful of years, you played with Billy Joel. You, you, the, you, your time with Billy ends. I mentioned to the success that Billy had early on his career that you were part of. How do you get off of that high and then figure out what you're doing next in terms of music? Uh, I, I think when, when life starts to dictate some things, which are families, yeah. which are, um, you know, your quality of life, you know, um, you know, drinking and drugging is not something you really want to do. But back in the seventies, that was a thing that sure. a lot of people did. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think everything gets put in a proper perspective when life gets in the way and you go, okay, so now we've made all this money. What are we going to do with it? Sure. You know, how, how are we going to have enough money in 20, 30 years? So you start thinking about that. Yeah. So, you know, the high of uh, the, at the, the level of music and the level of playing that I tried to maintain kept me employed every day. So it wasn't like, well, if I leave Billy, what am I going to do? Well, I left Billy and I went with, with the Beach Boys and then yeah. I went with Elton John and then I went with Tommy Shaw. And then I went with uh, Charlie Daniels and you just kind of move from group to group sure. and people who want you to play and each one wants you. And, and now you've been thrown against the wall and you have stuck and people going, well, I want Richie. I, you know, <laughs> well, we want Richie. Let's, so it was a great, a great move for me, but you, you never come down off the high, but you've got to maintain it in a proper perspective. Sure. In, in the early eighties. Oh, well, I shouldn't say early. Oh well, yeah. Early eighties. You open as a founder of and owner of Coast City Sound Studios on Long Island, which is where guys were putting together uh, recording stuff, which is where you sort of meet Carl, I believe. And he asked you to join the band at one point. 
opening that for you then and then getting to that moment, was that something you could forecast or was that something that, again, another moment of just happening in the moment? Well, it was interesting because Carl and um, Al and Bruce had come here. Max Weinberg, you know, Max Weinberg, yeah. Max uh, and Jimmy uh, uh, um, Vivino were doing this project and they needed uh, and the Beach Boys were performing in Jones Beach, which is like 15, 20 minutes from my studio. And they needed to do some recording. So they called up to bring them here. And of course, I knew Carl, you know, and at that point, um, I, I wasn't interested in joining the Beach Boys because I wasn't sure what their behavior was, what what their M.O. was, what they were doing. But I I wanted a clean life. I was loving working with other people and not really touring. But Carl came into the studio and checked this out. <clears throat> he gave me a cassette. <laughs> Remember those? Yeah. <laughs> right. And he said, here, learn this music. See you at the New York State Fair next weekend. Wow. He said, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, okay. I figured I'd do a weekend. And it ended up being 20 years worth of playing with the Beach Boys, you know? Wow. So I, I, I listened to the music. And if you're a Beach Boy person, and no matter who your artist is, I, I was very aware of what the music was. Brian Wilson's parts that I had to figure out were not the easiest, sure. but I figured them out. I got it together. I went on stage with no rehearsal. <laughs> And did the show, and Carl flipped out. Mike flipped out. They all. Uh, Al Jardine was my biggest fan. Sure, he loved it. He loved saxophone, and Bruce was great. And that was the real Beach Boys. And I said, yeah. okay, I'll do this. And I did it for the weekend. Then it was like, do you want to go to Europe? Do you want to go to Japan? Do you want? And it was like, okay, sure. And I and then I <laughs> I joined up. Well, that in itself is, is another thing to, to be, have such fandom and respect and I think acceptance from those guys because they're still heavyweights in, in the music world. People have had on who play with the Beach Boys told me about their audition process and their entry into the Beach Boys and, and how that went about. And I've learned through watching interviews with other guys how it went for you. And you basically kind of just said there how you were given a cassette and then you're like, oh, here you have to play these songs and this weekend we'll see you and you better know it. Was there any other process of getting into the band or is it just that moment and then your performance showcase what you could do? Uh, I, I think it was, first of all, Carl knew who, uh, who, uh, what I was and who I, what I, you know, cause I, we opened up for him with Billy. Yeah. So he already knew me and my capability of playing the saxophone. But with, with Brian's arrangements, it's baritone, there's flute, there's alto, there's tenor. And I also played keyboards right. and percussion. So, it was just not me blowing my tenor saxophone. Sure. A lot of people know that I've done on New York State of Mind. So I had to fill, fill that. And um, I totally got very cerebral on that and, and went deep and learned the parts, learned all those baritone parts. Right. And, uh, and and Brian was around at the time. Right. And he he would come to the gigs but never really get on stage. Sure. But, uh, he was around. He, he knew me as the sax player, never knew my name. At which one point I actually played on the Smile record for him, right. and he never knew, really knew my name. <laughs> Just called me sax player, ah, sure. sax player. You know? um, so to to be part of that was really really special. And you're right; these guys are heavyweights. The Beatles have referenced yeah that sounds many times before. Even the new documentary that's out that's been out this last past year, the, the three part one. Yeah, there are segments which. The Beach Boys are mentioned sure. that they were the Beatles were very, very concerned. Well, how come the Beach Boys got eight tracks or 16 tracks <laughs> and we only have four? We should get, you know, four more tracks in our recording. Sure. They were very, very aware of yeah. the Beach Boys. And think of just think about that. <laughs> just think about that. You're a young guy. But the Beatles and the Beach Boys were like thinking about each other. Sure. You know? Uh like like any any club two club bands would be thinking about sure. each other amazing um, uh, just an um, um, amazing part of our musical history well you, you see you know rubber soul i believe inspires pet sounds pet sounds then inspires i believe sergeant peppers and then or whatever the album was revolve or whatever brian says because sometimes the answer changes and then smile is supposed to be at the time the the uh the uh rebound off that but then it didn't come out then until it came out 40 years later which in itself is a masterpiece of that 
circling back to your intro into the Beach Boys, those here's have something, also here's something too. Remember, uh, like uh, Gary Griffin and Bobby Fig yeah. and Billy Henshi and all those guys. They're all West Coast guys. Yeah, I'm East Coast. <laughs> sure, they're eating avocado toast and I'm eating pizza. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it was not an easy. The the entry wasn't like oh you know just come yeah. on I, you know I was. I was an East Coast New sure. York stats player, yeah. you know. Where am I going to fit in this sure. thing? You know? Those who have been also on here have told me about moments that they've had with Carl or they've experienced when Carl was on stage as they as the leader and MD of the group. It was a moment called the Carl Wilson stare. So what happened is someone it was played, called the stink. It was called the stink guy. <laughs> someone would someone would play the wrong note, and Carl would look back, stare at them, ask if they're okay, and then come back a few times. And after the third or fourth time. The person would hit the road. Did you ever experience that yourself, or see someone get that when you joined? Uh, we called it the stink eye, okay. And we could we could be right in the middle of uh, "Help Me, Rhonda," and somebody would clam. He would he would know <laughs> which guy made a mistake and gave him a look, right? Mm. I, I never really saw Carl. Uh, there was an expression you would you've never been in a Beach Boys unless you've been fired at least once or twice, <laughs> you know. And uh, I don't know if the firing ever came. It never, never came with me uh, where Carl turned around and said, you know, your history. But I, and I really never saw it. The, the years that I played with Carl and it was the real Beach Boys. Um, and why do I say real Beach Boys? Because there was Carl, there was yeah. Al, there was Bruce, there was Mike, you know, and sometimes Brian. Uh, and even Dave, Dave Marks was around yeah. too. Um, so I never really saw that, but that was there. We all knew that Carl was listening. Sure. And we all knew that he gave us a stink eye. If you did something like, whoops, he, he, would, he knew it. Well, when, when you're with them, they're around, if not exactly around the time where it's their 30th anniversary, they come out with the, the, that box set in 1992. You joined Billy at the time when he's, you know, a handful of years, he's, he's sort of fresh still to the scene. Join the Beach Boys, though, at that point. You sort of talked about it. How do you fit into it? What was it like joining them at that time when they'd been at around for three decades? Probably the best times of my life. <laughs> uh, think about it. Think about it. You know, um, the, bo both jo joining the Beach Boys. Let's go back for the Beach Boys. Joining the Beach Boys. Remember, I, I maybe played on one or two Beach Boy records, um, Summer in Paradise record, and maybe another one. But but the, the notable Beach Boy records was way before I was sure. even thinking about playing with the Beach Boys. I was a young kid in high school. Sure. Right. And so, this, you know, think about that. It w that was pretty heavy thing for me to be part sure. of. With Billy, I created that music. Yeah. So that was my, those were my records. Sure. <clears throat> and all I needed to do is make sure that I played them correctly when... I got on the road. Sure. And remember, when we made those records, Nolan, back then there was 24 tracks. Okay. okay. So the drummer probably got four, six, seven, eight tracks. I got one track and probably one take to do my solos. Wow. That was it. But that's the that's the beauty. What a concept. That's the beauty of music. Sure. That's what we're supposed to do. Not this 200 tracks of making comps like the conversation I just had there with my engineer, the comp to vocal, they took, you know, S's off a, off a word, put them on another word and, and then melodyne them, auto tuned them, beat shifted them. That is BS, bro. <laughs> you know, you get the beach boys in the room, you get the Beatles in the room, you get Billy Joel in the room with all the musicians. That's how we made those sure. records. And that's why they're that good. Sure. Yeah. That's, that speaks power so to, to the join. So to join the beach boys, Think about those sessions back then. That I wish there was. Uh, I was a fly on the wall. You know, yeah. those were amazing, amazing sessions with gr great players and and their harmonies. And sure. Brian Wilson, Brian Wilson, a genius. <laughs> yes, genius. Well, the, him and the uh, and the uh, Wrecking Crew. I mean, the two a combination that is probably the, the greatest of all time in the studio. And you see of good vibrations and how long that took and how precise Brian was with. And you said with Billy how precise Brian could be in the studio and could hear every single note of every instrument on the record. And it come, you say, well, that, that doesn't sound right. How does that work out? How that work out? But then you play it and you say, damn, it works out and it sounds amazing. Now, 
I was watching the other day again for a, a, a millionth time, whatever it was. There was a music video that came out with the Beach Boys for their song Summer Love off of their Summer in Paradise album. And I was looking and I see there's Al, there's Matt Jardine, there's Mike, there's Bruce. And there's another guy in that music video who's playing with them on the beach and in the boat. And it's a man named Michi Kanata. And yeah. what was that like for you to be part of that process, being in a music video with the Beach Boys? <laughs> uh it, it's like a dream it's yeah. like a box to check but that's that's how you know, they felt about me and I, I how i felt about them they saw my s- sincere love for them and for their music and to be part of those things um i got chosen to do it uh why because they they decided i was sure. there for the picket i was there i would love to but can i meet up to what they wanted to i guess i did <laughs> you know i guess i did what they needed and they wanted and sure. it was an honor matt jardine and jeff peters the engineer i mean we're i spoke to jeff peters yesterday i talked to matt jardine uh once or twice a month i mean yeah. i still talk to these guys all the time they're my dear friends sure. and it was because we had this bond sure. you know and how was it like to play and to do that to be part of that to be you know to to do uh, full house with Stamos to do um, 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 things that the Beach Boys were asked to do for TV shows and stuff. I was it was it was amazing. Sure. It, Baywatch, that was Baywatch. Yeah, yeah. Sure. it's it's amazing sure. to think of. It. You know, I'm almost going wow. I, it was just amazing, but I showed up. You know, after after um your time with the Beach Boys ended and, and Carl had passed away, Al had formed a group. And you were part of it, and that, that sort of, and you still play with them recently. You played with them last year, maybe when they stopped on the to, on the road for his tour in New York. At that point, though, when you're with him, and even now to this day, when you occasionally play with them, what does that mean about his relationship that you have with them, but also his appreciation for your ability as a musician? Uh, I think that it's a very mutual respect that we have for each other. If Al Jardine, Al Jardine, think about it, is a Beach Boy. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, I have played with the Beach Boys, but still Al, Al's son is Matt, who's my dearest friend, who I actually produced a record for and work with. So when they come into town and they ask me to play with them with Carney and Wendy, um, and I was in the Beach Boy family and friends for years, sure, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it It is really special. It You know, it's not about anything but love and music. There's, there's no money transactions. There's just show up, see my friends, hug, get on stage, what song you want to play. Let, it's just great. And we did that recently at the Sony Theater in, here in New York. Sure. And I, I saw that tour and it was great. Not that show specifically, but that that, that tour. Yeah. And of, of course, um, it's just a mutual thing uh, uh, that we both did. I love Al. He loves me. I love Marianne, his, his family, his wife. And uh, they love Shirlene, my wife. It's It's just really... The Beach Boys were very family oriented. Sure, yes. And the uh, the me- the metaphor of the Beach Boy family and friends, it really was family and friends, sure. especially with Barney and Wendy. Yeah. And Al and um Adam was in the band at one point yeah. too. Remember that? Sure. Adam was in the band as well. So you got Adam, Matt, Carney, Wendy, Al. Wow. And then Ed Carter, who was like exactly. family guy forever, Bobby Fig, myself, Billy Henshey, may he rest. Yeah. Man, how much better can it get? Nothing. It can't get much better than that, as 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 you say. The last nearly ten years of of your music career, almost oh, since twenty fourteen, you've been with the Lords of Fifty Second Street as the musical director with other guys who longtime members of of uh, Billy's band. What's that like for you now at this point to still be to be playing his music and to be playing with the guys that you played with with so many years? It's it's actually more fun than it was in the very beginning. Uh, Because these are my friends for 40 something years. Um, We've got nothing to prove other than the fact that we can play this music in the right keys and the right, you know, and we we have three original guys. Billy doesn't have three guys originally. He's the only original guy in his band. He loves us. He thinks it's great. Um, It's um, we just did three show uh, two shows this weekend. We're working continuously. It's been uh, let me tell you something, Nolan. It's been really amazing to play this music again. I don't know if the, if you check out the Lords of 52nd Street 
uh, YouTube video promo 2022. All right. Check that out. All right. <clears throat> and, you'll, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Sure. Principal guy who's playing the parts of Billy that remember you, we had said this 45 minutes ago, the music that we did during the turnstiles days was a young, vibrant choir boy voice that Billy had sure. with the endurance of playing in the keys and playing the tempos that we did back then. All the bands these days that are trying to emulate Billy are emulating Billy of now, sure. which is just an older version. Yeah. My guy in the Lords of 52nd Street is the version that was back in the 70s and All 80s. Right. People freak out sure. over it. Because sure. they go, wow, this is like a needle drop. Sure. This is like that. Oh, yeah. And Liberty and I are way on top of it, way on top of it. It's like, this is amazing. Sure. And that we're getting great reviews. And and we, we're, like I said, we have nothing to prove other than the fact we that's yeah. our music too. And we're just playing it as best as we know how. Well, that's it's that's the thing that 45 years later, if not, or more later, it, it's still as bit busy. You, you said in the Vibe Chamber interviews, you know, sell crowds selling out you know thousands of people there it, it's it's just it's an amazing thing but that's what happens with good music that it always stays around and it stays at the top of, whereas current music sometimes um falls beneath it or since you know the early 80s when you opened the um studio you've had a laundry list of, of talented musicians come record there and i'm not going to list them all that would take too much time but for you from your perspective a, what does having the studio do for you musically, but also to have that laundry list of talented musicians that we all know perform there? Uh, it keeps me sharp. You know, it keeps me sharp. You know, uh, I, I love new talent. I love the, 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 the new people that come in. Plus, we have very um, uh, um, famous, whatever that means. People. Yeah. We had the Jonas Brothers in last week. You know, right. we've had in... Um, uh, Dream Theater, we've had in Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, Celine Dion. Um, uh, I mean, the list goes pretty, uh, Mark Anthony, Billy, of course, sure. Ray Charles. <laughs> so, you know, we've we've had an amazing, uh, Lionel Richie, we've had an amazing bunch of people that's been here. Sean Mendez was here recently. Tori Kelly was here recently. We did the Holy, uh, the song Holy by Justin Bieber. We recorded that here. Uh, Michael Pollock, John Bellion. It's been, it keeps me sharp, bro. Sure. It, it does, you know. No, um, <laughs> no, go ahead. And I and I and I love that. And most of them that come in, uh, which is interesting. And this is a very, <clears throat> I'm humbly saying this, have not been on as many records as I've been on. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like, oh well, what what do I know? Well, I kind of do know how to make records and how to tour. <laughs> sure. So. Uh, I don't want to sit upstairs. This is my office that you see here. You know, I, I have three great recording rooms. I don't want to sit up here selling studio time. I'd rather be downstairs in the control room sure. in music with them. Yeah, well, that me, that's because, you know, you love music so much. And that's the only thing, not to say that you, you can't do anything else, but that's the one thing you know how to do the most out of anything else. So you want to be around it as as much as you can. Now, similar to asking you about the um, Summer Love video, in the same vibe chamber um, interview, I keep mentioning you talk about your affinity for um, jean shirts, one that you are wearing right now, and how you have thousands and thousands of them all over the place. What is what is your affinity or love for the the type of shirt that you, that, that you are wearing right now? I never have to never have to think about what I'm going to wear. Sure, okay. I, I signed records this weekend uh, on the Fifty uh, Second Street record. I think that's the one. And there's a picture of me inside with a, a shirt exactly <laughs> like this. Um, I have, and people buy them for me. So sure. my closet is filled with them. I can get dressed <laughs> in the dark, bro. I, you know, yeah. just take another one out, sure. you know. I feel just comfortable. I'm comfortable in my own skin. And, I, you know, I got, I've got a Yankee shirt there we on. Go, yeah. You know, big Yankee guy. Uh, yeah. why are you from Boston? Where are you from? I'm from, I'm from uh, Rhode Island, but I'm a Yankees fan as well. Are you? Yeah. Playoffs tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so I, I get to play with Bernie Williams. I don't sure. know if you know how, about my discography with the Yankees. I played the Star Spangled Banner about three weeks back at the stadium. Okay. Uh, I did spring training for them. I do a lot of Yankee events. I'm comfortable. I love baseball. I love music. I'm comfortable in my own skin. Sure. You know? So to ask about the shirt, I just, it's easy. It's easy, you know, yeah. I, I, anybody else but myself. Speaking you know. of speaking of baseball, you 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 played at Cooperstown for 
Derek Jeter's induction to the Hall of Fame, being that Derek Jeter won the greatest players of all time for one that greatest teams of all time what was that like for you in terms of musical accomplishment well musical accomplishment was great because i played the star spangled banner with bernie williams cooperstown think about that word cooperstown if you like baseball here mm -hmm. i am center stage at cooperstown sixty thousand people and we it was the, the sound system was amazing musically uh, you could you could catch it on uh, on a youtube video oh, right yeah. um it was great. It was a great musical sure. moment, but it was more of a baseball boyish sure. moment for me because uh, when, when a ball player goes into the Hall of Fame, there's usually a good handful of older um, inductees that come to honor him. This was Derek Jeter. Sure. Everybody wanted to be there. Every From Reggie Jackson to um, Cal Ripken, to, I mean, all these amazing, amazing ball players, And I got to play the gala the night before. So okay. I'm watching um, Wade Boggs dance with his wife. It's crazy. <laughs> sure, <laughs> you know, yeah. all these great ball players. But uh, musically, they, they they were they were great. Uh, and Wade Boggs was great because he said something really nice to me. Raleigh Fingers was great. Cal Ripken was great. Reggie, it was just amazing. Sure. Musically, they got to hear me do what I do, right? Yeah. And I uh, watching all these guys line up from the commissioner to Joe Torrey. It was just great, and of course Derek. Yeah, Derek. <laughs> Another thing to check off the uh, bucket list. You know, at at this point in your career, and, and you've mentioned in other interviews, your influences. You know, Charlie Parker, Faz Johnston, the Brecker brothers. At some point, though, there are those I think of, of my generation who I'm sure look up to you in, in your ability, your opinion of, of becoming those who you were inspired by. You then become the inspiration for current saxophone players. How do you look upon that in terms of the music world? Uh, it's a, it's a a big honor and. When I was coming up, Mike Bricker said to me, um, don't try to sound like me or David Sanborn, be yourself. And once I did that, uh, I became this guy, Richie Canada, who can play sax solos that people want to hear in my, in my sound. I don't have to emulate anybody. Sure. Uh, so what, what that has done, and I got on a, a lot of big records, okay, and played with a lot of big... So for those young sax players coming up is to see that. And it's a, it's, it's a great honor you know, to be yourself and to be able to be recognized as, oh, I know that sound, that's got to be Richie, or it's got to be Clarence Clements, sure. you know, or it's got to be Dave Sanborn, you know, but I, I was very, very happy to cross over that, because in the beginning, you know, you have a blank coherent screen, and you take all this data, you take Charlie Parker, you take John Coltrane, you take, you take, and all of a sudden, you take it all together, then you become you. Sure. But you got to listen to those guys in the beginning. You have to figure out how they got those notes, how they got that sound, how they played those patterns. But then you take all of that and become your personality sure. and your playing. Well, it's an amazing thing. And I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I, tell it to, I told to Gary Griffin. I, I told to Bobby. I've told to a few others on here. Many moons ago when I was in middle school here in Rhode Island at the middle school, I, I went to, you had to sign up for, a music, uh, some sort of music class or some sort of thing. It was either music appreciation where you learn how to play the keyboard or it was playing an instrument. And I have no real music ability. I'm a hack of a shower singer, but there was one instrument I chose to play because I said, hell, this seems interesting. And it was a certain instrument that you played being the saxophone. And I, I played it for about one year and that was it. I, I had no <laughs> burning desire or, or passion to uh, want to keep practicing besides playing Who Let the Dogs Out and uh, Happy <laughs> Birthday. <laughs> But that that was it. I, I never practiced and my parents weren't too happy about the money they wasted on my saxophone. But I always appreciate good music before you close up shop and, and you retire, which I'm sure you probably will never retire. Um, is there something that you you're looking to accomplish one last time, maybe a project or maybe playing somewhere, even though you played everywhere you could play? Is there something you'd like to do to check off your bucket list before you close up shop? Um, let's let's talk about the close up shop thing first. Um, uh, like a baseball player at 37, 38 year old, yeah. you know, um, Brian Wilson, 80 years old, plus, you know, it doesn't make a difference. He's still Brian Wilson. Yeah. So for me to close up shop and retire, if I did that, I'd probably take up a hobby, like maybe play the saxophone. <laughs> so I've never, 
I can't retire because I've never had a job. Sure. All right. So this is a continuous thing. Yeah. Uh, it's not a, it's it's not 65 and you collect your pension and you stop playing or 55. It's it's not that. It's a continuous desire. You've been blessed with the talent and you keep going with it. It's just to the day you die. Sure. It, Keith Richards. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the Stones, the Beach Boys. Al Jardine was 80 something. Is he 80? Was he yeah. 80 this year? Right? He's out there still working. Yeah. Tell me, tell me what baseball player at 80 years old is doing his gig. No one. No one. Yeah. So um I, I'm probably as like you said, and you you prefaced it by saying you're probably never gonna retire. We can't because this is what I do. Yeah. Okay, so what was the what was the second part of the this, question? This, the second part of the question is before, if if you ever were, is there something whether it be a project oh, or maybe some or somewhere you want to play, even though you played everywhere, is there a project you'd like to accomplish or place you'd like to play before you say that's it? I, I'm sort of gonna step back a little bit. Um, th this year there's been a couple that I I checked off. One was Cooperstown. Come yeah. on, <laughs> Derek Jeter. It wasn't like who was that ball player that yeah. you conducted, Derek Jeter. Yeah. You what what ball player unanimously got into the Hall of Fame ever in all the history of baseball? Derek Jeter. Yeah. Okay. So that was a big one to check. Okay. The other one was I played Central Park last summer uh, for, with the New York Philharmonic all right. with Andre Bucelli <laughs> and Jennifer Hudson. Wow. And I did New York State of Mind in a 70-piece orchestra. Wow. Big bucket list check. Sure. Uh, to play this national anthem at Yankee Stadium, I played both stadiums. Okay. I played for a playoff game. Big, big box to check. Yeah, big box to check. Um, the the next one I want to check is them getting into the World Series and me playing there. All right, that's what I want to do. We'll we'll see. Hopefully that happens this year. The last few years they 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 almost made it a few years ago in the ALCS against the uh, Astros, which was a, a heartbreaking ending. But hopefully this year is is this will. We'll see. Well, well, sir, before we end today, and again, I want to thank you so much. I want to end on a little game called the One Word Challenge. So in this, I'll throw out a few names of people or places or things that have some connection to my guest. And my guest this week being Richie Kanata, the legend himself, has to do his best to say a word or two that comes to mind when he hears it. Or, or sentence, whatever it feels like. So, Richie, are you ready? Go ahead. Uh, first one, Brooklyn, New York. Home. Uh, Long Island, New York. Second home. <laughs> uh, saxophone. Uh, my life. Music big part of my life billy joel my dearest friend and greatest composer uh carl wilson oh not enough words or sentences of what i feel about carl wilson uh, i love success it's there for the taking <laughs> and last but certainly never least in this cosmic universe we all live in called earth richie canada <sighs> it's all about the music exactly that's all about the music if you can enjoy some good music from time to time that that's all the matter as well Richie, I want to say sincerely thanks a lot for taking the time to do this. I know you're a busy man with the studio and stuff. So, again, I appreciate it. Thank you. You did a great job. You really did, Nolan. Uh, I, very, I, very, I, very, very thorough, thorough on all your on your history. Oh, I appreciate it. And hopefully if you, you all enjoyed it out there because who the heck wouldn't. And when my guest this week, Richie, wins a Grammy Award for his next great work in the studio or playing, you're going to say, holy crap, I should subscribe. So subscribe, follow, comment, share, all that fun jazz. Follow on Twitter, Nolan Carnight, and on Instagram, Nolan Carnight Show. Richie, is there anything you'd like to put out there and share with people either to come see you or projects to look out for in the near future? Well, the Lords of 52nd Street, number one, is really, really big. Um, come check this out here. And the Co and Cove City Sound Studios is something that uh, any any musician throughout the how big your 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 wide uh, audience is, how how um, from Rhode Island to L.A. to to Georgia to Florida to New York. We're here for the taking, too. So the studio is 100%. But uh, check us out with the Lords of 52nd Street. That's really number one. Check up, You should check them out. When when they come around to my area, uh, I will definitely be out there. And yeah, you be, you can. get in touch with me. Is yes. that that John Lennon behind you? Uh, yes, it, my aunt has a poster. It's uh, of John Lennon and the other um, the other Beatle guys. I have that on my wall. Really? Yeah. My aunt is a big, uh, whatever they call it, when they go to the um, uh, yard sales and found that and gave it to me. And I put it up on my wall. It's a little deformed because it, it sat in the garage for a while. Let's see if I can see it. Can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> the same photo. Wow. Wow. What are the odds? Uh, how about these guys? 
There we go. Yeah, the Beach Boys. There we go. Matt yeah. Jardine. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, right? Um, amazing <laughs> stuff. Well, well, Richie, I don't want to keep you too long. I want to thank you again for doing this. And in the words of Johnny Carson, the Dean of Talk Show, I bid you all a heartfelt good night. Till next time, take care. Thank you.